Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, everyone, uh, participants. This is a a series which is being started by the uh, International Dentistry Association as well as by the collaboration of uh, International College of Dentists. In previous episodes, what you say as season. We have covered the anatomy of temporomandibular joint. Today, we are starting a new season, and that is by the name of uh, diseases of temporomandibular joint. There are many diseases of temporomandibular joint, which actually matters a lot. And for that purpose, we have divided these. Episodes into four groups. Where we will study the temporomandibular joint diseases step by step. I'm proud that uh, I'm here as a principal and dean at HBS Dental College in Islamabad, with reference to all my different parameters at International College of Dentists, Medical Association and Dental Associations. Although no, I am not president, I am ex-president of Medical Association and Dental Association. This slide was made in previous years, so it is written like that. But now I am the ex-president and ex-president of PMA and Pakistan Dental Association. Temporomandibular giant. It is a C which covers many diseases of temporomandibular joint. I will not go into detail of the anatomy of the temporomandibular joint right now because the temporomandibular joint anatomy we have covered all in detail. And uh, now, with the background, I will, we will go directly to temporomandibular joint disorder. Temporomandibular giant disorders are basically divided into six forces. Deviation in the form, that means the anatomical structure which is being given by the Almighty God to this condyle and this glenite fossa. They have proper orientation, they have proper shape, they have proper physiology. And that physiology is very much calculated on the both sides, and they are very much equal. If there is any deviation on any side, and it change the form of that temporomandibular joint, that result into temporomandibular joint disorder, and that form may be genetically developed, traumatically. Uh, oriented, or there may be any tumor or local growth. The second disorder which we used to face is this displacement, and that is what we are going to study in very much detail. Then is displacement of disc condyle complex. This discondyle complex actually is a complete equilibrium and a structure organization. It has to be in a very limited movement and it has to be flexible to some extent. Hypermobility of a joint. Is another, what you say, a disorder which results into discomfort of the patient. Then is the dislocation. Dislocation is the absolute removal of the joint from the socket. It is displaced. God, when we were studying the anatomy of the TMJ, we have seen that there is. No stentigial limit of temporomandibular joint. 
and that is oriented by the node or what you say slit or condensation of the bone just anterior to glenoid fossa which is called eminence and this eminence actually is a parameter where it has to stop if god forbid condyle leaves this boundary it is shifted anterior to the condylar fossa and that is called dislocation it may be unilateral one joint is dislocated or it may be bilateral that uh, both joint are dislocated then we come to inflammatory disorder you see there are two things in the joint that is one disc and secondly superior and inferior space disc fluid that is synovial fluid this synovial fluid actually contains the inflammatory cells and very much required for phagocytosis and defense of the joint capsulitis is the term used for the inflammation of the capsule by any infected mean or by a traumatic mean if there is any hurt to the capsule of the joint it become inflamed and when it flame if it give a extra pressure or inflammatory pressure to the joint and that is called as capsulitis but synovitis is another term which is not from the outside of the capsule it is from the inside the synovial joint superior and inferior space is lined by synovial membrane and this synovial membrane has the fibrous cells that is called as fibroblast as well as this give an a very important mechanism of lubrication of the temporomandibular joint and that mechanism is called the weeping mechanism it absorbs the temporomandibular joint fluid that is synovial fluid and then it releases the fluid drop by drop and that drop by drop removal of the uh, synovial fluid from the synovial membrane is called a weeping mechanism and if there is any inflammation any problem to this synovial uh, complex it is called as synovitis retrodiscitis is a very important mechanism if you look at this mechanism going on right here if you see this is the posterior limit and these are called retrodiscal ligaments these are after the bilaminar zone and posteriorly it is attached to the posterior superior limit and to the neck of the condyle as well if there is any problem to the posterior ligaments and there is any inflammatory lesion in this area then it is called as retrodiscitis now there is a range of degenerative diseases we are going to cover it and lastly we will cover the ankylosis temporomandibular joint which are one fibrous the joint is attached with the, the base of the skull by means of the fibrous adhesions and secondly by the bone and that is where the main parameters which we are covering so coming to the reason what is a broad term used the exact cause are not yet there are sometimes multiple factors which are working at a time and these multiple factors actually resulting into different type of pmj disorders and these different cause what we see is the three factors the first factor we will discuss that is the predisposing factor 
natural or acquired they create the side of melody actually these are the factors by which mean we are moving to words pm that mean that there is one bus and it is going to words what do you say steam and it is going to fall in it when it, this bus starts and move towards the road of that steam that means that the, this movement is a predisposing factor for going to hell are going to a disaster so we have to look for this bus and we have to uh, look for that the direction of this bus should not be towards the disaster so predisposing factor must be addressed in a very nice way so that we can move towards prevent then is the triggering factors they abruptly disturb there is a mechanism of mesticate apparatus going on there is some detectors there are some collars there are right to left movement muscles going on and this all is going on with reference to our equilibrium if there is any abrupt that mean trauma that mean any hard bite abrupt disturb disturbances may results into a trigger fact a situation lacking equilibrium with its progress installation having permitted a structural or a functional modification that can be decompensated and provoke the appearance of clinical signs the predisposing factors actually are without sign and symptom but the triggering factors initiate the sign and symptom these are the factors where you would see a cruzal disturbance deviated opening of the mouth and you will see pain on opening and these all things if they are present these are integrating factors and that we have to study the maintenance factor say a tmd is occur now this tmd will suffer for a longer time if you are not going to address or you are not going to halt the maintaining factor these maintaining factors should be stopped should be addressed these may be in the form of pathosis of the structural functional or secondarily neuropathy no these neuropsychiatric mechanism they are going on there so we say pencil biting palm sucking wide opening of the mouth deviation of the mouth they were giving a trauma to the condylar area by the unwanted maneuvers these are things leads to the maintenance of the temporomandibular joint disorder for a longer period now we will discuss all these parameters step by step predisposing factors these predisposing factors are basically natural are acquired they create basically this site of melody anomalies of a cruzal function many anomalies of the cruzal function occurs say deviation in the bite due to a carious stroke a patient stop 
is biting towards the affected side due to perichronitis. The patient do not want that I should bite on that side and start biting on the, the non-affected side. And that results into overstasis of that joint where he, he is biting and tension and breakage of the ligament where he is not working. So what happens that there is a occlusal deviation. Next is the missing teeth. If the person has a one side missing teeth and he is only biting on one side, that will result in the same type of consequence. Then there is cross bite, there is over jet, there is a anterior cross bite, posterior cross bite. These anomalies may result in stresses as a temporomandibular joint. Ligamentous looseness. This results by the functional man of normality. This may result by the systemic diseases. Like collagen diseases, it has been noted that there is more ligamentous looseness. And the giant is generally deviated from its proper path of occlusion. Parafunction, as we know everybody, the nail biting, pencil biting, there are different type of uh, chewing, uh, uh, say bubble gum chewing on only on one side, or betel nut chewing. These are all the para functions that the people used to do. And psychological anxiety and depression, these things result into bruxism. And what the patient used to have the grinding of the uh, areas and resulting into adrenal of the uh, whole uh, occlusal plane. And that is a psychological anxiety and distraction. Now these are the predisposing factors which actually initiate the uh, basic parameters or basic etiologies of the temporal medical Now next is the triggering factor. Tension and emotion shocks, basically, they favor the para The para function which you have started in a predisposing factor, now they are being more potentiated by means of tension and emotional parameters. Abrupt occlusion, arthrogenic change from the orthodontic or prosthodontic intervention. Say you insert a partial denture which has the high spot and it hurts the opposite jaw and it hurts the opposite side of the joint as well. Orthodontic brackets sometimes in class 2, div 2, we have to uh, require the posterior bite plane. And this bite plane should be very equal and should be very balanced. Sometimes these Orthodontic posterior bite plans are not balanced, and that results into trauma of any side of the temporomandibular joint. And the, if you will keep this appliance of the orthodontic more in your uh, oral cavity, that results into more and more potentiating the predisposing factor and resulting into the formation of the two temporomandibular giant dysfunction syndrome. Now the behavior changing. This ILAD I have told you that the chewing bubble gum, clinching, and this is very bad habit. That the clinching results in sports, clinching in results in anxiety as well. Angriness as well. And nail biting, especially you are stressing on one single point, and the giant disc is being potentiated on a very 
particular point. And that particular point where you are pointing again and again that there is a disk displacement and against this abrasion there is a disk problem. Then traumatism. Forced mouth opening in the dental or surgical treatment under general anesthesia. Especially when you are going for the intubation. Whether this general anesthesia is for oral cavity or for any purpose else in gynecology, in a case of a, any other general surgical procedure, when you intubate orally or when you are giving intubation nasally and you are placing your laryngoscope in the oral cavity and you are opening the mouth extraordinary beyond the limit of the standard opening that is 45 to 47 mm and then you are indirectly giving tension to the posterior ligaments of the temporomandibular joint and rather resulting into rupture of that. Then accidental trauma to the chin or from the blow we will discuss. Now, the, say by the triggering factor, the temporomandibular joint disorders has occurred. Now, for the transient period, if the triggering factors are being addressed and they are being treated, then it is very obvious that by treating these factors, you can control the temporomandibular joint dysfunction. But if you are not able to address the triggering factor in a very accurate way, what is going to happen? That uh, these temporomandibular joint diseases will linger and result into more chronic diseases and more irreversible diseases patterns. And these are called as the maintaining factor which actually do not let the temporomandibular joint to come back or to heal or to perform its proper function. These are secondary tooth migration. This is very important. The tooth, these are teeth are placed in a certain level. And temporomandibular joint is adjusted according to that uh, uh, facets or that uh, uh, functional occlusion parameters. Now, if you change the tone for cosmetic reason or for the reason of the orthodontic movement, what results that these can be migration, whether it is are slow by the brackets or abrupt by any orthopedic surgery. Now, so these will go on hurting the temporomandibular joint and the joint which is already in disease it will not come back. Alveolar remodeling. With the passage of time, the age, the alveolar bone bone dissolves. And in separate, especially in e dentulous patient, the alveolar bone is so remodeled that it will sometimes become the pencil line. And the temporomandibular giant has to close itself with much force. And that force is exerted by the weak masticating muscles. And these masticating muscles, which are weak, are unable to produce a normal occlusion, or what you say a central occlusion relation. And what happens that this results into more stresses on the disc and more stresses on the TMJ structure. Occlusal consensus are also very important and these results into intercuspal deviation and intercuspal marriage. Now the acquired period efficiency, primary or secondary hypersensitivity to pain and psychological fragility which we have discussed, these are all very uh, uh, important and they are a very potentiating factor. If these factors will remain, then it is going on the 
maintenance factor for the temporomandibular diabetes. Now, step by step, we will take all these factors. You see, this trauma right at the angle of the jaw. And the blow which is given to the this cricket star right at the chin. Now, this blow is a single event. Just one blow is sufficient to cause multiple parameters. These parameters are number one, either it results into jaw fracture, neck of the condyle fracture, body fracture, or even cranial injury. In this regard, if the intensity of the trauma is too much, then you can expect the clear bony damage, that is fracture of any type. And especially on the opposite side of the neck of the thumb. The second is that if you have the blow intensity slightly less, and that is blow, that the blow is coming on the chin, rather than coming on the angle, it is coming on the chin. The more towards the joint, it will give all the forces directly to PMJ. And these forces are called crushing forces. These crushing forces are being delivered to the base of the skull from the condyle, crossing the uh, disc and delivering it to the glenite fossa. And this glenite fossa now divert these forces to the whole base of the cranium and the petrous part of the temple. So what happened? As the intensity of the blow goes up, there is a much force for crushing of the disc, crushing of the ligament attachment, as well as to tearing of the capsule. So, this is first initiating, or what you say, or the predisposing factor with reference to macro trauma. Next is that these type of macro trauma in sports can occur. You see these type of sports when they like you see this gymnastic person is given directly blow to the chin. So this is going to hurt directly at the base of the joint. And if it is like this, you may have the directly blow on the chin. And these sports even actually participate in the initial start of the temporomandibular joint dysfunction syndrome. Next we see the intrinsic trauma. These are two examples of the single event macro trauma. You see this man is known, he's from India and he's known that he used to take the bricks. It is reality that if this man is habitual for taking the bricks, what will happen to temporomandibular joint? And so much force is giving to the joint, and what will happen to the disc equilibrium? And that results into basically abrasion at the lower surface of the disc. And when you see this gentleman, Taking this much bite, this is not a normal opening of the mouth. This is more than I think 55, 57 mm, which is beyond the limit of a normal opening of the temporomandibular. And this even, although the joint is within the green eye fossa, joint is not dislocated. But the posterior limit ligaments, how much this stress has been given, 
to the posterior limit of the joint. And that tension may sometimes result into absolute tear of the posterior ligament. And that may be the start of the temporomandibular joint disease for this person. Now, this is another clinching or grinding of the teeth during non functional movement of the mandible. This is called a nocturnal bruxism and related to sleep disorder and may be influenced by the stress. I have seen politician, liar, judges, bureaucrats. These people has a work of tension all the time. And what happened? That these people start grinding, forcing their teeth by the action because the memory center and the uh, exciting centers are very much nearer to the motor center of the trigeminal nerve. And when there is excitation there, the motor center of the trigeminal nerve, it becomes excited. And when the, this, uh, uh, there is excitation, it results into overactivity of the temporomandibular giant as well as the overactivity of all the masticatory muscles. And the patient starts giving bruxism. What happened in the initial stages? It is like this. But with the passage of time, this whole the area it is gone. So initially, the distance was this. But with the passage of time, this distance is reduced to this distance, and the joint is being gone up. And for that purpose, there is more stresses being built in the inferior level of the temporomandibular joint as well as the posterior aspect of the temporomandibular joint. Now, this is what we see in the bruxism patient. This lady, always a young person, and this is, you see the young lady, and this, you see how much there is grinding of the teeth in very initial stages, say, it's a very, very initial stage, right, and now there is bruxism. Now, sometimes there is a diurnal bruxism. These are, you see, there's one tooth. This patient is habitual for grinding up this. And you see, there is slit on the upper. It is going on like this. One cast you are grinding. Like this. And when you see in the patient, it is like this. This patient give bite to this area. You see, it is like this. So that results in a very particular pressure on this side of the temporomandibular joint. This is another, you are looking at something which you don't like. And by just standing, you are killing things. And you see the, your masseter muscle, it gives the impression of your excitation. And that is very common, and especially when there is uh, any sports going on. And uh, you see when there is a horse riding here going on. And uh, this is a constant pressure, and uh, this patient is clinching the mouth constantly. That results into pressure at the temporomandibular giant bilaterally 
and that is very dangerous. Sometimes it do happen like this. This is emotional and physical. This especially the person who is not happy with his form. And he want an unpleased behavior with his father, and he is want that his father should be angry with what he is saying. And during this procedure, he is clenching the mouth, and that is a very bad emotional stress which is going on there in the child. On the other side, you see this person. Is going to face a ball. Who is famous in having a very good repute for giving a fast ball? And say the last ball of the tournament is there, and this man has to perform by his last bat. So at this level, what the anxious way he is looking. And he's moving. It will going to give a real stress on the temporomandibular joint. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the normal behaviors in our normal life, and which we do not generally stress. Next, you see in your all the routine uh, practice, and that routine practice is the malocclusion. Better it is the form of anterior open bite. It is class two, div two, class two, div one. Better it is a force bite, which I already I have uh, explained it to you. There is anterior class bite the patient used to have. So these type of factors also give a predisposing or precipitation parameters for the temporomandibular joint disorder. There is another very important thing, which uh, actually give the stress to the temporomandibular joint. That is anterior going or posterior tilt. In both level, you are going to have the stress on the temporomandibular joint. Anterior limits results into sternocleidomastoid pole, and that indirectly. Which is placed right here in the mastoid air cells, and there is a styloid process as well. The stylomandibular ligament is there, and these are parameters when they are under stresses. They give an extra weight exertion to the temporomandibular joint. On the posterior port, when the trapezius is more active, and the posterior were there, all the Cervical uh, muscles, they are very active. These all stresses result in pulling stress of the sternocleidomastoid and the stylomandibular ligament, which results in torque production at the temporomandibular joint. And that is a one posture imbalance, which is very uh, actually annoying and which is one of the most important things to be done. Now, when you see the posture deformity like this, you see here this is a balanced one. The sternocleidomastoid is right here. Here the sternocleidomastoid is here, and here the sternocleidomastoid is right here. And this whole pulling of weight towards the forward side, these all muscles had to get the pulling. For the posterior level balance, and that gave a real stress to this masticatory operators. Now we we'll move to the temporomandibular joint dysfunction syndrome, which is also called as the TMD. Our temporomandibular joint arthritis it has been also known. The syndrome is actually. It is a combination of many, many factors, and it gives you so many signs and symptoms, which results into syndrome. Temporomandibular joint symptoms. To look at the person, he is sometimes touching at the forehead, 
as a letter frontozygomatic area at the low level of the joint both sides sometimes sometimes at the upper level of the joint sometimes coming back towards the eye and sometimes deviating the chin and he, he says that I have seen everywhere if we look at the text Clinking or probing knives in the joint. This is the first thing. Patient say, I have clicked. A tuck sound is there. Unable to open the mouth comfortably. Sometimes there is pain and sometimes there is no pain. But by opening, patient is not wrong. Locking up the jaw and trying to open the mouth. Absolutely. Free opening sometimes not possible due to restriction of the temporomandibular joint, internal derangement of the disc, and that results into restriction of the movement. Now, neck pain, shoulder pain, back pain, headache, these all are related to the stresses which is given to all these areas by the nerves and by the attached musculature. Patient has irregular bite. You see the patient, this patient is maneuvering in a very irregular way of bite. Swelling of the face around the jaw joint. When there is any organic disease, say inflammation is there, say any infection is there, you can expect there is a slight swelling. Our patients sometimes go on giving maneuver to this giant movement. What happens? That uh, this stresses of the fingers also results into inflammatory episodes in the child. Ringing in the ear or decreased hearing. Yes, it is one of the most important things. That when we are studying the anatomy of the temporomandibular giant, we have seen there are two uh, ligaments which are attached. One is the sphenomandibular ligament, attached to the sphenomandibular ligament, and second is attached to the superior ligament of the uh, posterior superior lig ligament of the disc. And one is attached to the incus, second is attached to the malleus. And these cross the temporomandibular giant area, enter into middle meatus, and they are attached to the incus and malleus. And when there is any problem in the posterior ligaments, there is problem in the ear. And patient, who used to send the patient, I have seen so many people, they send the patient to ENT surgeon. While this ringing sound, and this pain in the ear is very much related to TMD, very much related to temporomandibular joint. Sometimes there is dizziness and the vision problem due to constant stresses, lack of sleep, and lack of an increase in the anxiety. These symptoms are also bad. Now, before going to temporomandibular joint, uh, 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 disorder, we will discuss the articular disc disorder first. The articular disc disorders are multiple, and uh, these are very much in our routine practice. Raman, can you hear me? Okay. Articular disc disorders. First, we have to understand the temporomandibular joint, which we have studied during our uh, temporomandibular joint. This is the posterior ligament, and on round and sliding movement, and that is the lateral ligament. And when you see after cutting it, 
you will see the superior giant space, you will see in inferior giant space, and we will see the posterior attachment of the articular disc by the bilabular zone right here to the neck and the superior level. If we look at the disc, you see this is very flexible. It is superiorly convex, inferiorly concave, and it is a fibrocartilage. It is attached by many means anteriorly and posteriorly by the muscle. The main muscle which is attached to the disc is the lateral pterygoid muscle. If you look at the lateral pterygoid muscle, you will see a superior head is inserted like on the condyle and it's uh, the superior head right here is attached to the disc of the condyle. And you see there is superior giant space and inferior giant space, and that is the actual placement of you. So talking of all the muscle, the main muscle which we used to face in the temporomandibular giant movement, and especially with reference to taste, and that is lateral pterygoid muscle. And this lateral pterygoid muscle play a very important role for the movement of the temporomandibular giant disc. So, if you see the normal position of the disc, when it opens, it slides with the joint like this. And come to the disc of the giant, come back and stay in the joint. You see, this is the normal movement the giant is moved with the condyle and posterior ligament remain attached with it and there is, when it comes back after rotation, translucidation, then the giant is coming back right in its passage. This is the normal opening of the joint and normal opening of the temporomandibular giant function. But when there is pathology or when there is any problem with the temporomandibular giant disc, we are going to face these consequences. Ladies and gentlemen, up to in, today we have covered the different diseases of temporomandibular giant, different factors affecting the temporomandibular giant and their diseases. Then we have studied every factor of the temporomandibular giant, especially for the TMD. Then we have studied the normal disc position in the giant. And now we are coming at the level that the clinical classification of the temporomandibular giant disc displacement and this, uh, uh, function, uh, what you say, is the second episode of this whole our uh, 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 season of temporomandibular giant diseases. And up till now, we have covered the things, and I am here to answer all the questions, which uh, whatever you like. Thank you so much, Dr. Arshad. Can everyone yes. hear me? The question uh, is from Rizwan Arshad Malik. What is the assessment criteria to distinguish the treatment plan for TMD with or without psychological review of the patient? Now, the assessment criteria for the psychological review is entirely based on many things. The well, first thing is the gender, second thing is the age, and third is the degree of psychological disturbance. 
with these parameters we assess the psychological disturbance now this psychological disturbance maybe our nature to be treated by the medicine or by the treated by the consent of the psychological or psychologist person the psychological expert or third thing is the whether it is our true psychological problem or whether there is a, a organic disease so this you are going to evaluate on the basis of the investigation these investigations are number one you have to go for the analysis of the giant simple radiogram then you are going to have uh, and going to have the analysis of the mri then you are going to have the analysis of the occlusal plane any occlusal disturbances or at least any bad habit or any uh, what you say uh, factor which affect the occlusal lab so after assessing all these parameters you will decide that whether this tmd is by means of psychological problem or by means of the functional problem or what is what you can a, a pure organic organic problem. Yes.